Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast, and I am Marcus. So, this is super exciting, to me at least, and maybe I'm late to the party and I'm telling you nothing new altogether with what I'm wanting to share with you today. So... Um, great story I came across very recently. So it seems that the ancient Greek math wizard, cult leader, uh, genius, weirdo Pythagoras, who came up with, of course, we all know the famous theorem A squared plus C squared equals C squared. It seems that he didn't come up with it. Yeah, you heard right. In case you haven't heard of it before. It seems that he heard it from someone and this someone heard it from someone else. And the whole thing got traded down in history, dating back to a thousand years prior to Pythagoras. Isn't that crazy? A thousand years before Pythagoras, people already knew about this famous theorem. We're talking about the ancient Babylonians and how do we know all this? So the story goes that in the 20th century, a certain Mr. Edgar Banks, who is said to be basically the the real Indiana Jones, bumped into a mysterious clay tablet and he didn't bother deciphering it. He just kept it as Indiana Jones type people would do it. At some point, a guy called George Arthur Plimpton decided to buy it from Indy and named it Plimpton 322. So almost a hundred years later, the secret of its inscription can now be revealed. Some very smart people from the University of New South Wales gave deciphering it a stab and guess what they found? The Babylonians knew everything about trigonometry. Isn't that crazy? And allegedly they used it to design stuff like pyramid slopes. Of course, there is voices who speak against the theory, but more voices speak for it because, hey, there is this tablet and translating it speaks a very clear language. So what the heck? So maybe it's a little discussion amongst historians about details of the scripture, but the basics that the Babylonians had an edge on Pythagoras Um, cannot be debated, I guess, anymore. One thing is clear. The ancient math gurus loved sharing idea, which makes pinpointing who came up with what a bit tricky. Did the Babylonians kick off trigonometry and then the Greeks just took it up a notch a thousand years later? Hmm. I'm diving into this topic, into this epic tale today, because it sparks a big idea, to me at least. If we're dreaming or if we want to dream big about the future, and this is what we are constantly doing on this show, right? So if we want to dream big about the future, we cannot just forget our past. And I think Elon Musk is one of those guys who really understand those principles. Elon even talks about the first principles thinking, the first principles idea, but I guess he probably got that intern from some old school philosophers. Um, Anyways, who cares? It's always good to go back to the foundations. And I'm always really, really enthusiastic about digging up cool stuff from places and times we've kind of forgotten about, like our own indigenous backgrounds. And so I'm super proud to be chatting today with Laurie Rousseau Nepton, who just got back from a multi-year research stay as a resident astronomer at the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope in Hawaii. Laurie is also the principal investigator for SIGNALS, a large survey program aiming at observing over 50,000 star-forming regions in nearby galaxies. But Laurie has more. In addition, Laurie is not just looking at the stars. She's also deeply connected to her own indigenous roots in Northern Canada, 
Laurie's journey spans from the vastness of space to the depths of human stories and heritage. Enjoy, my friends. Laurie, if you had one wish as an astronomer, as a cosmologist, what would it be? What big riddle of the universe would you want to see solved? Wow, that's a big question. And it's a hard one to pick. Uh -huh. um, it's difficult. Um, I'd like to know if uh, everything that is in the universe, the energy that is in the universe has always been, or if it emerged from the nothing. That's what I would hmm. like to know. Hmm. Is it possible that it emerged from nothing? Like it is scientifically, is it possible? Uh, it's not out of the question. I would say uh, that it is, uh, um, you know, to a level of our understanding, like, um, you know, when you look at the theory of the universe, uh, it is so somewhere, you know, it's possible somewhere um, in the dimensions where we can't really picture hmm. uh, things, but yeah. So that could Otherwise, be some... if, you ask, yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you ask a physicist, they would say, no, uh, energy cons <laughs> is always conserved, so <laughs> you can't create anything out of nothing. That's fascinating. What's the difference between an astrophysicist... An astrophysicist and a cosmologist, yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm an astrophysicist, per se. Uh, cosmologists are a branch of astronomy, uh, which I would describe as people studying the large-scale universe, the far way back, early universe, um, the condition of the universe, primor primordial conditions, just after uh, the expansion, what we call the Big Bang, uh, understanding how the universe expand its shape um, and all of the different uh, phenomenon that happens in those extremely large scale. That's, that's a cosmologist. Hmm. What's our current best understanding of of the universe where it comes from are we because this is it seems like currently it seems like we're in an age of discovery a new age of discovery we've got james webb yes uh, up true. and running yeah. we've got we, we're making progress on so many fronts um um on earth in space so if this is an age of a new age of discovery, what new understanding of the universe are we making at the yeah, moment? Yeah, at the moment, uh, we're making so many uh, progress. Uh, I kind of want to mention, well, you, you just said James Webb. So I, I'm, I'm specialized in studying star formation. So for me, for my field, James Webb, James Webb is a big push on that side because um, it is capable of observing stars far beyond what we've been able to observe so far. And it is observing far in space, but also in time because uh, the, mm -hmm. the two goes together. And um, we can then see the stars, the first stars that are born in our universe. Um, and we've always known that they were different than the one we see today. So being able to have direct observation of those stars with James Webb is absolutely unique. Um, so that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, I know that some of my colleagues are really interested in dark matter and dark energy and what are the sources uh, of, of those two. And uh, there's a lot of progress that is also being made there, um, not necessarily knowing but moving forward towards uh, explanation for those two, those two things. Um, and so, I, yeah, I kind of want to say in every field of astronomy, there's big progress right now. It's going fast. Um, how, how can you know that one star is farther away than the other one? So or, uh, let's start all over. How can we know yeah. that the sun is eight minutes away? How do we know this? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, but, uh, like if, if you, if we didn't had all these observations that we've made in the past centuries, <laughs> it would still be like a calculation to make, right? 
Um, but uh, I, I kind of want to say the distance of the sun is so well established just because of the orbit of the Earth and how well we know uh, the mass of the Earth and, and its motion around the sun. Uh, for other stars, um, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. There are different ways to know distances uh, of the stars, but it's not trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, some stars, we are lucky, are close to us in the Milky Way. And because of that, we can use a phenomenon that is called parallax. Uh, so the Earth is moving around the sun. So if we look at a star, let's say in June, the middle of the summer, uh, and we have its position in the, in the sky, uh, with reference to many other stars around, and then we observe it uh, in the winter, in December. And so we have moved a little bit in space. Uh, and as a result, depending on how much that little star will will move in the sky, uh, we know its distance, its triangulation, uh, basically. Um, so that's for the close ones. If we're looking at stars that are in other galaxies much farther away, mm -hmm. then we need new tools, other tools. And um, uh, what we use typically are called candles, astronomical candles object that tend to have a very specific luminosity mm -hmm. um, that we can relate to. Uh, Cepheids are uh, some stars that are uh, often used for that because they have a period, they oscillate. Mm -hmm. Their period is very close to their, uh, is related to their luminosity. So uh, if it's fainter, if it's brighter, it's closer or farther, you know. Uh, so we can, we can infer the distance with that. Um, so that's just a few examples of how we calculate distances. You have your expertise in the formation of stars, but maybe right. you have a little bit of intel uh, when it comes to a very recent observation of the James Webb Space Telescope that made some headlines. Of course, I'm, I'm talking about the K218b um, discovery, um, the, the planet that may harbor life. Is there... Anything from your end that you could say to this discovery? Uh, yeah, that's are a we good alone? Question. Is this now the final proof that we're not alone? Uh, will it ever satisfy? You know, people. I think that until we see little uh, aliens moving before our <laughs> eyes, we, <laughs> we won't believe it. Um, I think that uh, it's a really encouraging discovery. Uh, they are w waiting for additional data huh, to get a uh, better definition of uh, the atmosphere of that planet um, to really uh, be sure <laughs> of what they have detected. But it is... So how it, how sure there. are we at the moment? Like 50% sure, 60%? Well, uh, we know that the atmosphere of this, of this planet uh, is promising, containing signs of life. Hmm. Um, but signs of life that we would consider signs of life on the planet Earth. Um, is it the case for another planet that might have a different chemistry, that might have different weather and energy sources? Um, so that is, that is a question, you know, that will probably remain. Uh, and so I know that for some people, uh, this data won't be enough to say that there is life on that planet. Uh, but it will be a very good candidate to find it. Hmm. There's two telltale signs, or three, I think, of it being perhaps a place where life or is 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 active, and that is CO two, and that is methane, and I think the third is a is a molecule molecule that only exists on earth if it is traced back to um biological processes right yeah yeah th there are signs are they ultimate proof that's the question because those molecules are present also in space um hmm. and so don't tell uh, me it's all yeah it's always about where they are and with yeah. which condition and what what amount uh is it changing through seasons? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a lot of parameters, basically. Mm. So how, how long do you think to find out more about this discovery? Yeah, 
So uh, one of the things uh, that is um, important about this discovery is that once we find an object like this, um, all of the other telescopes that have different uh, equipment to look at this object differently mm. will be turning their uh, mm. eyes towards it. Sure. And we will get way more data very quickly about this object. Mm. And sometimes it might seem too time consuming to look at an object for days, for weeks, mm -hmm. because we don't know if we're going to detect something. But once we know <laughs> that there's something interesting there, some telescopes are going to be staring at it <laughs> to get mm -hmm. extremely uh, deep data. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really looking forward to see that. And, um, and within the next decade, we, we'll also have access to new instruments that are being developed now mm -hmm. that will mm -hmm. be on Telescope of the Future. And that will be very, very helpful to have even more detailed information about the atmosphere of that planet, but also how, like I was saying, how it could change through seasons uh, on that planet. And what team are you in the... We're alone or we're not alone in the universe? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we're alone. Yeah. You don't I think? think? Be a, yeah, I think it'd be, we would be foolish to think that we're alone. <laughs> I mean, like, it's statistically impossible, isn't it? Statistically impossible. And, you know, I, like I was saying, I'm studying star formation. And uh, even though it's very far away from exoplanets and, and life on planets, mm -hmm. um, there is a really tight link between what I study and and the evolution of life in the universe, because uh, the evolution of life starts in space, not necessarily on the planets, but it starts in those nebulae and the clouds of gas huh. in galaxy. Because when you look at it, DNA molecules that have this beautiful ability to replicate and, and transform it and transfer information, their evolution from way back must have started in space where those little blocks of amino acids started to gather together in uh, very, very, um, uh, you know, empty environment where there's not a lot of other molecules while well, the density is very low. And they were interacting with the light coming from the, those stars forming. And that light was that kind of ingredient that was breaking up molecules, like giving them a hard time, basically. Hmm. And molecules that would replicate that would uh, survive some radiation from the stars those molecules had characteristics that would mm -hmm. uh, help them to survive in the space environment and and you know acid and and blocks that forms dna have those kinds of uh of characteristics uh so it's not life uh but it's the ability to replicate and we see that in molecules at this level and then eventually they they end up in a denser environment where you have all this energy and all of the material to evolve even more quickly, like on planets, um, and become something more than just a molecule. So for me, it's, uh, it's you know, um, it's so interesting to see how now we can study those, the evolution of those molecules and exoplanets. And, That's so fascinating. And yeah, I think we're going to see it everywhere we look at. Uh, where we have the right conditions. That's so fascinating because it's like uh, once you know what you're looking at, it's it's going to be everywhere. Um, it's it used to be uh, like this with, with quasars, then with exoplanets. Um, suddenly they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, and now I guess once we're um, discovering l traces of life, we'll see that the universe is a living thing, maybe <laughs> or whatever. So. It's it's very like also philosophically or ontologically very interesting to see that once we have a grasp of something cognitively, we're able to see it everywhere because we're yeah. we have maybe we have words for it. We have built up the synapses, and once once that is possible, it's everywhere. So it's it's like. I don't know who came up with that, but the universe, with every question you ask the universe, it grows um, in your mind. And I think yeah. this is so true. Um, yeah. So the more curious you are, the, the, the larger the universe gets. Oh, yeah, totally. But at the same time, 
we see more exoplanets. At the same time, we are even more eager to to learn about these these new worlds. Uh, one thing is striking, though, is that uh, the planet Earth is is such a unique place, nonetheless. So, even though there are billions and billions of exoplanets out there, um, to find one that has those quality to help life evolving. Mm -hmm. um, those quality are really rare and uh mm. that is uh that is something you know the thing is statistically we're not alone but uh maybe the nearest na neighbor is pretty far <laughs> how would we feel about the ultimate proof as humanity if we really discover that this place harbors life in 120 in a distance of 120 light years i mean like this is also a, a minor nightmare because we know we can never get there we know that there's <laughs> there's life on in this place but we will never be able to get there to really do research uh, on it and maybe discover or shake hands with the little green man or the little green slime or what, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, I don't know. How do you feel about such a discovery? What, what would it do to us? Because it could also be a very frustrating moment. You have something, but it's never in reach. Uh, um, kind of want to say, I'm like, I'm like uh, thinking there's like a good aspect of that and a bad one. So, of course, we would like to study it more and know more about mm. it. Um, but at the same time, just the fact of knowing uh, can be sometimes enough, you know, knowing it's there. Uh, maybe uh, knowing that we can't disturb it, you know, mm. and that it's peacefully going to also evolve and be there like a uh, like a good neighbor <laughs> and knowing and knowing yeah. we cannot conquer it and this will drive us crazy <laughs> because this is the only thing we humans have done successfully for, <laughs> for for hundreds of years now we finally cannot do it yeah yeah something that uh, cannot be disturbed and uh Destroy it is it. also going to be there for generation and generation yes. to look at and be mesmerized by it yes so I like that idea. And it doesn't prevent us to send message uh, mm -hmm. and maybe hope that in a hundred years, or I should say the tw twice the amount, in 240 years from now, we might get an answer. <laughs> should we send a message? Because you know those those concerns that have been expressed over the decades now. No, no what, I, How I would do you send feel about this? You would, you would send it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. And, and tell, and tell the, the slime where we are at? <laughs> Well, it's the slime, uh, and uh, if if uh, if really like uh, they are just like us, they they will uh, probably just be answering back and not being able to reach us either. <laughs> or <laughs> or uh, um, if they do, if they have the ability to go around and, and come say hi, I don't think that they will be that uh, that bad. Yeah, uh, that's that's my feeling. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I spent the past six and a half years in Hawaii, on the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, just after finishing my PhD, actually. I moved to Hawaii to start a position there as a resident astronomer for the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And I, um, I was hired because I had expertise with very specific instruments that um, were operated on the telescope. Mm -hmm. So I could help other astronomers um, to use them um, and do science with them. Um, during the time I was there, I also developed my own science programs, uh, including a large program that is called Signals. And it's not the signals from the aliens, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the star formation signals <laughs> that I'm looking at. And uh, so I gathered a lot of data and that, uh, that data I... Uh, I keep with me <laughs> dearly and now I will have students helping me to analyze, analyze it here. Yeah. And I will still continue developing instruments here. I have a lab in uh, the University of Toronto and we'll be developing uh, 
new type of, of instruments to look at the light differently uh, and give it give us more information. But this period is over now, right? You're, so Hawaii time is over. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, huh. Yeah, How it was a good feel? time. Yeah, it was a good time. I learned a lot when I was there. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, Hawaii, the people, uh, what it is like to feel, to live in a place that has absolutely no seasons, <laughs> uh, except from the whales that come in the winter. There's no uh, big uh, temperature variation, and um, and also to be close to that mountain, the Mauna Kea, that huge mountain, and um, have, having to work with so many different people. That was great. Um, really Say, good time to learn. A couple of years ago, I heard. There was protests by indigenous Hawaiian uh, people yep. against the building or restructuring of an observatory on one That's of their correct. mountains. Yes. So, so what was that all about? So on the Mauna Kea, uh, Mauna Kea is, first of all, a sacred site for the native Hawaiians. Um, some some ceremonies happen close to the summit. Uh, some ceremonies also happens at the base of the, the mountain. Um, and there is also this science reserve that has multiple telescopes uh, close to the summit. Mm -hmm. um, the first uh, telescopes that were built there also probably initiated a protests, but back in the base communication was not as it is today. Uh, and now there's this telescope called the 30 meter telescope that was planned to be built on a, um, an area of the mountain that, uh, was kind of a good area for building a large telescope, a really mm -hmm. large one. And, uh, and the native Hawaiians, after everything that has happened, um, in the past decades with the science reserve and, and everything, they decided that that was one too many. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and that they had their word to say on what was happening up there and how it was going to happen. And it did trigger uh, those protests that fortunately today with all the communication tools we have, everybody heard about. Mm -hmm. And it is making a difference. Uh, so right now I know that um, the, ma the mountain management team has been completely reorganized, mm -hmm. including some native Hawaiians. Uh, on the board and um i know that this telescope uh is not getting built <laughs> at least mm -hmm. not now <laughs> and uh because of discussions this. are yeah mm -hmm. discussions are on the go yeah discussions are on the go to see what will be the future of astronomy on the mountain of uh, Mauna Kea. how do you feel about this um, you know when i see the pro when i saw the protest the first time and when i also moved there there was some protests uh, a couple of years after i moved there i could only understand them uh because they were on their land and they felt like they didn't had have the uh the tools or the uh any way to actually have a say on what was happening on that land and it's only unfair to them uh, honestly, and we see that in a lot of other countries uh, with native population, including in Canada as well. Maybe it's maybe not with telescopes, but uh, to me, it felt very similar. Um, so, so knowing that their uh, their um, protest was heard and that people were doing modification, uh, I, I found it very hopeful you know for the future mm -hmm. um i kind of wish they didn't had to do that mm -hmm. but we're at a you know in, in an era where uh it seems like we still have to uh, scream loud to be mm -hmm. heard and so um i'm glad that he could organize themselves so that it worked um mm -hmm. and what's happening next if there's going to be astronomy in the future yeah i kind of hope but uh, i want it to happen only if it's right so there's a price for that. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I hope that, that the projects are going to be really listening to the communities. What comes first? Tradition or knowledge acquisition? Huh. 
Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I think that they both go together because uh, it's not like if native populations don't want to learn more. Mm. Uh, communities around the world are focused on education just as much. You know, they just do it slightly differently and uh, they might have slightly different priorities as well, which is normal. But um, I think that culture can, has to go with with knowledge. You know, one good example that I like to give is, you know, I'm studying star formation and throughout my research, very high, high, um, you know, cutting edge research with cutting edge instruments and all this technology. I'm studying the cycle of stars forming and then contributing to enriching the universe with new, ele with new elements that enables the formation of molecules and ultimately from us to be here. And if we go back hundreds of years ago, just during the time of colonization, mm -hmm. the idea that we came from the stars, that we were part of the stars and that our ancestors were in the sky, even though it's like spiritual and kind of poetic in a sense, it is actually very close to what is actually mm -hmm. uh, the science that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so I wish, you know, hundreds of years ago when scientists heard these concepts, even though they were more spiritual, I wish that they had been inspired by it mm -hmm. and that they had looked that way first because we'd, uh, we would have probably uh, gained much, much uh, time in, in, into making discoveries in that sense. Um, and so culture, knowledge, the inspiration, the science, um, intuition is something that is very important. Then it kind of goes together. I know that a lot of mm -hmm. scientists like to be just really, really, really rational, but we are all inspired by our, by our dreams and, and by things that we hear, that we see, that, uh, we feel is right. And so for me, yeah, it's, it's just coming as a, a circle. Where does science stand? Uh, when it comes to traditional indigenous knowledge, embracing maybe would be a little too far. But um, are yeah. is science listening? How yeah. was that? Did did you have any any such experiences during your work in in Hawaii with the native people? Yeah, I got to meet really interesting groups. Also, talk about their. Uh, their perspective on the sky. Uh, there was also a lot of my collaborators that were doing uh, works uh, specifically on on the the native culture and the native knowledge, and and I got to meet um, also the director of the Imiloa Center here at, uh, there in Hawaii in Hilo, which is uh, Imiloa means to seek far, to seek mm -hmm. for knowledge, but far, um, and it as a planetarium, and and they have all these. Uh, presentation of the Hawaiian knowledge in such a very sensitive way. And they also explain uh, scientific uh, endeavors with all of the technology that comes with it along with it. Um, mm -hmm. And I find it very beautiful what they did there. They, they really developed something interesting. And so some of my co collaborators were also working with um, people of the language department, for instance, to um, to extract some of the information from the Hawaiian chants, uh, and connect it with current science. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one example, one good example is the, the, the Hawaiian chant uh, that is uh, named the Kumulipo. It's a very long chant that talks about the formation, creation of the universe and the species. And, um, there are so many things in that chant. It goes from, the first light to the formation of stars and planets and even the evolution of beings from the ocean first to the land and, and even the evolution of species is in there. <laughs> and hmm. so I, uh, I really appreciate it to see these, these projects going on and see how well it connected. Um, and so for me, it is important because when we learn science in classrooms, we always start with history. Who did a discovery yeah. X and Y first and how it happened. Um, and it's important when you are from a community that you hear 
from your ancestors, what they have contributed, how they have seen it, and how they have moved toward this uh, this new knowledge, you know, uh, and how they have worked to build it. Because everybody, all the communities around the planet have worked together to build it. Hmm. Um, so that's, yeah, that's how I see it. I think, uh, I think it, uh, it is really important to make sure that we have, we get all of those uh, little scientists interested in science, no matter where they're from. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, um, recently we have, we have cut too many ties to our past because we're so driven by the future and what lies ahead, especially in Western societies. I think the larger networks, what used to be extended families, um, are breaking apart. I, I can remember the extended family um, when I was little was extending over multiple generations. And, and those extended family bonds, they are rapidly breaking apart in in Western societies. So this is, this is a huge loss that's, that's happening <laughs> because yeah. it's not only a loss of family bonds, it's also a loss of knowledge because, yeah, sure. um, yeah. um, back in the day, you always had someone when the youngest daughter had her first child, you would have the elders, uh, the female elders who would, help her along yep. those along yep. that way Today, participating into yeah into teaching uh, e exactly child, yeah a and today it seems like a young mother needs to learn it all by herself um with the help maybe of nurses and and hospitals but where is that <laughs> where's that traditional knowledge i think it seems like we're we're moving back in time in yeah. certain aspects. Yeah, we've lost a lot of knowledge on that regard. And it is uh, it is not only sad, but in some cases, extremely, uh, uh, you know, almost dangerous and important because that knowledge base, you know, the knowledge of um, those knowing how to teach, uh, how to learn, like everything that is related to the family and to the um, making every human being uh, ready for its, uh, long life. <laughs> yeah. Um, is absolutely essential. And with all of these tools that you then had from your family, you could do anything exactly. and you'd learn a lot. And as soon as you lose that, it, it's very quick. Uh, it takes one or two generations. Uh, it's gone. It's gone. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's much harder for, for an individual to thrive mm -hmm. uh, in the society mm -hmm. without these tools. Mm -hmm. um and yeah mm -hmm. there's i don't know if, if there's anything we can do about it it's this new uh new regime laurie you have roots in long traditions you're a member of an indigenous community in canada and please excuse if i'm misusing term uh, terminologies uh first nation um, a member of first nation people, right? Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yes. I'm a mem member of a, an Inu community called Um It comes from my dad's side of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a family of hunters. Uh, we go uh, every fall for the hunt. Huh. Uh, you north. also? Yeah. Yeah. It's a long story, but yes, <laughs> I was finally allowed to uh, uh, a little bit like almost 15 years ago now. So I uh, I've learned everything from from my dad, and um, it's something very dear to me. And I have learned a lot uh, going up in uh, in the the Ashok Mushwan Reserve, which is a uh, reserve um, that the, the words actually means where we go wait for the moose. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's exactly what we're going when we when we go there. Um, All we can do is sit it. and wait for the moose. Yeah. Well. It's a clever sentence because uh, in hunting, there's a lot of luck. You have to yeah. be a good hunter, but you have to see a move. <laughs> and it has to be close enough to you for you to have uh, any chance. So mm -hmm. I like the name of the, <laughs> the place for that reason. <laughs> it's a clever name. So 
you're an astrophysicist, a cosmologist, um, a scientist. At the same time, you have deep roots in indigenous traditions. So how do those things go together? How, how, or let's start all over. How did that come together in the first place? Yeah. So um, it goes together very well. <laughs> it kind of mm -hmm. is natural uh, for, for a person from the First Nation, especially spending a lot of time in the outdoors, trying to understand the environment around you, trying to understand the behavior of the animals. And um, it is all interconnected with so many different systems. I'm just like going to give you a few examples. It is related to the weather, the temperature, you know, the wind, uh, the rain. Everything is connected to what the animals are doing in the woods. Then the, it's connected with the moon cycle. The amount of light you have during the night will change the behavior of the animals at night. Um, it is related also to the fish in so many different levels of uh, the animal kingdom because they're all kind of interacting with each other uh, through the years and the different cycles that there is. Mm -hmm. So by observing that for years and being thought to observe things and be really mindful about mm -hmm. little details, Uh, you get a really good observer and you also develop the curiosity and the scientific inquiries. You develop <laughs> methods to, to, to process the information, to, uh, to use it. And, uh, I've always been a scientist and I think I've always been a scientist because of that. <laughs> uh, and you, you just, yeah, you go along, you ask questions and you learn. And that's what I've learned, um, to do the best in my family. Mm -hmm. So when I had to pick a, a science to study, I ended up studying physics because for me it was like a, a challenge, but also a beautiful science that studied the very small and the very large scales of the universe. And it would help me understand even more my environment and extend it to the, the space, you know, to, to space and to the universe. So, so I'm just continuing to do what I've been taught to do as a kid, just walking around <laughs> with my dad mm -hmm. and and trapping animals when I was really young. <laughs> so <laughs> it goes together. And, uh, and, uh, for me, it, it's not dis dissociable. Um, I kind of wish that it has never been dis dis dissociated in the, in the community, you know, uh, the skills that I've learned makes me, uh, capable of doing so many other things that I know people that haven't been lucky and haven't been trained like me when I was young are not able to do today. So I feel fortunate that I have this background. You know what? I feel like we're rediscovering the wealth of indigenous knowledge. This is how I feel. Maybe it's a personal observation. Maybe it's a, it's a broader movement. I do not know. But yeah. I feel like, first of all, it's high time to do so. Yeah, <laughs> we we could have started a couple hundred years ago, but anyways, it's it's not never too late. But yeah, I think there is this is a huge privilege on your end to have that connection to nature, because as we already discussed, losing that connection to nature that many in the Western world have means losing one's touch with life and ultimately with oneself. And this is yep. why we're treating the world. We're treating it because we have, we have no connection to it anymore. We, we're even lacking the words. We don't even know the names of the trees anymore. Yep. And once yep. you have no name for something, you don't care for it. That's true. And yeah. this is why I believe this is a huge privilege to have had a father like, like yours um, who has taken you out on a hunt and, and showed you how the world and nature works and interacts. Yeah. Totally. Am I romanticizing things or how do you I, feel? About no, it? but it's, it's even more true, you know, and I, I always uh, come back to astronomy because, you know, the, the earth, our planet is so special, you know, and, and we're affecting this environment. We see it now, like everybody can see that almost the, The, the sky is not as blue as it was. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and now we, we fully understand that there's a limit 
to the ever-growing uh, economy and to the ever-growing uh, size of the industries that are transforming uh, the environment and the chemical composition of our atmosphere and everything. And I kind of want to say, if you had listened to the basic of the philosophy of the First Nations across Canada, which is based on the fact that you are part of this ecosystem, and as an inherent part of it, you have to accept the fact that you live and you die and you're part of this, this, uh, this equilibrium. Mm-hmm. Um, and that if you stop participating in this environment the way you should be, um, it can only go wrong because it is meant to be working like that. Um, and so I kind of wish in the next couple of decades to come that uh, we hear less about economical growth, uh, mm. but more about sustainability and, and equi- equilibrium and, and, and reparation. How do we get back to something mm. that is more livable for this planet and for us? And the main goal into this is to understand what is our place on Earth and what is our role in this system. And um, since we're continuously evolving into something that is completely out of what was natural <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, it, it, it can only go wrong we have to stop a little bit and think and and maybe come back to this idea that uh, we have to just regain our, our, our place into the physical system and um, that, I think that's really important Laurie do you see a growing interest in in First Nations um, histories in First Nations wisdom by Western or other societies. It's, it's starting. Um, it's starting. It's starting slowly. <laughs> there hmm. are, uh, you know, sometimes people asking me if there's some specific knowledge that I am aware of in my community that is related to their science. And I'm talking about different scientists coming from all corners. I think it's a good first step. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done to save the knowledge because a lot of it has been erased and it's still continuing. Um, we are losing elders. We are losing every time there's one other elder passing away. We're, we're losing so much information and it's not like if it was written in books or online on the internet, it's nowhere else. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, uh, uh, for me, it's, uh, a time that is critical. Um, this interest, uh, this growing interest has to serve a purpose, has to help us pre- preserve the knowledge and use it uh, mm-hmm. for the generations to come. Yeah. There's this term, um, traditional ecological knowledge, that's um, making circles around the globe at the moment. Um, knowledge that has evolved over hundreds or thousands of years through direct contact with the environment acquired by indigenous and and local peoples. So would that be that kind of knowledge knowledge that you're talking about that could help the rest of the world, the industrialized world, the consumerist world heal and, and help heal the planet? Yeah. uh, I think, I think so for sure. Uh, the, there's so many examples of that, you know, and it's just about, it's, it, I kind of want to say it's all about sustainability. You know, this knowledge like was based on, uh, you know, how do you interact with the environment? Like, how do you, um, collect the right amount of plants, collect the right amount of animals? Not all of them. In what, which way, you know, I could, yeah, the, I, I was hearing some, like, uh, some, some archive documentary about uh, hunting techniques and they were telling how much they would, um, you know, harvest some of the wild birds here in Canada, just selecting the, the, the male, you know, and uh, if there was like a certain amount, then there was kind of a rule of thumb. You take that many, depending on how much Mm -hmm. you see. And uh, I, I really find it um, simple and and beautiful because that's sustainability uh, completely gr- rooted, you know, in the habits and the culture. Um, 
and they didn't have to do any complex statistical analysis of the population mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. animals to make this work. Mm -hmm. It just had been working for so long while mm -hmm. doing that, mm -hmm. that they had kind of stabilized it to a perfect state. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I see it everywhere, this, this kind of uh, long, uh, long established knowledge that is extremely valuable. What I'm worried is, as we see the environment is changing so quickly, how long will this still be relatable to the environment that we live in? Mm -hmm. um, so if we don't react quickly, the environment will change so much that there will mm. be no turning back. Beyond repair. And yeah, and then it will be, uh, we will have to build on something completely new and completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a hard time to believe that it will be better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, we, we definitely need to, to hear it, this knowledge now and, and try to, to apply it as much as we can. What, what kind of knowledge can you think of that you think could be inspiring now to our audiences that you'd like to share, like for everyday things, um, yeah. learnings from your life. Is there is there something maybe a couple of examples you would be willing to share on the everyday life? That's a really good question, you know, because I always felt like it's some something in the back of my mind. It's all, almost like a subconscious thing that mm. you don't yeah. really think about it. I never yeah. dissociated like so. It's not special for knowledge you. or like, yeah. yeah, whatever. It's yeah. just like the way I've been taught things. Uh, and I and I've been taught things in a very Western way as well. I went through the university and did my PhD, so I can see the world from those two lens. And uh, and for me, that 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 yeah, everything makes sense. Um, what I kind of want to say is, uh, you know, nowadays people are almost waiting for groups, for government, for large association to make the changes and and to actually like transform things and, and do things better uh, I would just say like to, to, to get more onto what you can do what the mm -hmm. individual can do um, it's for me it's the key here uh, because every single person can make a huge difference mm -hmm. um, if they put their mind and their energy into it and so I would just tell people to, to step thinking large and policies and laws and because it's no, getting overwhelming just, too quickly yeah just think about what you can do and uh and every little thing <laughs> is helpful mm -hmm. every little choice you make to make uh, your your life and your this your passage on this planet more sustainable mm -hmm. is is great and what you do also you're going to teach to your kids and to the people around you and you're going to have a huge impact it's going to make ripples and everybody can do that. Beautiful. I mean, like we sort of got distracted as a society, maybe also by the internet um, um, that we need to use the megaphone of technology to talk to the world about something. And maybe we should rediscover our own communities, our own extended families, that this is, this is the place, the analog space we need to rediscover, not the digital realm of the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because what is dangerous a little bit with this digital world? I mean, I've been going also like I've, in the past, I'd spend more time on the computer or on different media. And and now I'm uh, especially that I have a, a daughter that is very young. I'm kind of avoiding those <laughs> for mm -hmm. the purpose. Mm -hmm. But um, seeing those, you know, those two different phases in my life where actually I have put time into different things and you can then see what really matters mm -hmm. and what really have an impact. And right now, without necessarily being a lot, uh, having a, a huge presence online, I am making the most uh, impact. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And by talking to people, by taking the time to have those discussion, it is also important because I know people are going to listen to it and maybe mm. it'll trigger something. It'll trigger a change. And, and, uh, and yeah, I can only hope that if I convince one person to kind of uh, review uh, their ways of doing and, and think about it a little more deeply, then it's a win win. <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, so yeah. Laurie is, if you go back to those moments uh, when you were sitting next to your father on the hunt, 
and you being the academic um, scientist, um, is the is the sky, the night sky, more beautiful with or without scientific knowledge? Oh no, it's just as beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> It'll never change. <laughs> I think that uh, no matter when I, uh, how, how far I go back uh, and I can have a really good memory of those moments looking at the sky, it has the same feeling. And, you know, it's that kind of uh, magical uh, thing we have inside of us to be amazed by the infinity. Mm. And everybody has that. And just being outdoor in a place where you can actually see the sky with no, no uh, light pollution mm. and in the quiet and um and stare and that's uh something everybody can appreciate mm. i've never heard of anyone telling me that they they wouldn't do that <laughs> <laughs> how laurie how how do your elders react to you being a scientist um studying the universe because very positive uh, very positive positive oh yeah mm. oh yeah yeah They are, uh, they are proud, they are uh, interested, they are intrigued. They know the value of this knowledge. Um, they know the effort also that has to be done to acquire this knowledge. They really appreciate it. And um, I like the discussions that I have with them because uh, it's almost magically, you know, when you talk with uh, elders about an ancestral knowledge and astronomy, There are things that they know about astronomy that they don't even relate to astronomy anymore. Hmm. Uh, and so I've had like rediscovering, you know, the knowledge. I had rediscovered some of the knowledge that was related to astronomy, but just by talking with them. Uh, and that's absolutely fascinating. Um, I think it uh, probably arrived, via, you know, happened because of the process of colonization, the way it was done. Uh, some of the stories that the oral tradition, you know, uh, some of the information was forbidden, either by church or by other reason, mm -hmm. but some of the information had to be said differently. And, um, and so stories, um, sometimes had to be transformed. And so they kind of lost the, the connection between a story and its actual knowledge because of that. But then if you go back in time and you, you, you hear different, uh, version of the same story, you can, retrace mm -hmm. the real version of it and the version that was more full of this kind of connection with the sky connection with science also um is still living in there it has mm. just been diluted kind of <laughs> and uh, uh we made really good discoveries i i uh i think that um yeah it, it it's a conversation that i i, mm. I want to continue continue to have mm. to make sure that um, we have this knowledge resurfacing uh, before it's too late. How how does it, or does it influence your work as a scientist? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I always kind of want to say yes, but probably subconsciously. <laughs> like, why am I studying star formation and how stars are formed in different environment of galaxies? How different generations of stars affect the next ones and eventually ultimately affects us like this whole cycle of um of like the environment of the universe because it's it's exactly that it's what i study and it's mm -hmm. just part of what i started to do when i was hunting in the woods <laughs> just understanding the different cycles and where what's our place in there so I think that subconsciously, yes, the reason why I'm doing that and I decided to study this specific topic comes from my education and who I am. Um, then also, I'm an instrument builder. I like mm. to build what I'm going to use to look at the sky and actually use it and look at the sky and do my own science with it, going from A to Z. <laughs> and so I'm going to continue to do that. And I think also it's something that I've learned from my family. Uh, so, my so dad what, was a what, civil engineer. He was a builder. Um, what what do you mean? Do you yeah. build your own telescopes? Not the telescope, but uh, the instrument, the the camera that goes on the mm. telescope that mm. takes the data. Do you build that I yourself? Build. 
So I built it in team. This is a like large project. So so the one I was using in Hawaii, I was part of the team that built okay. it. And now that I am in Toronto, I'm going to lead the team that's going to build another one. Okay. Uh, so my role is going to be slightly different, but I'll continue to do that, that kind of work. What up next for Lori as a scientist uh, now gone for, for good from Hawaii back home in Canada? Yeah, they are, uh, it's going to be easier to go hunting. <laughs> um, but also, uh, I'm pleased to be at the University of Toronto and the Dunlap Institute because I will be here working with a lot of students and also closer to many collaborators. So these interactions are so important. It's just an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, you need their uh, questions. You need their, uh, their curiosity to move forward faster. Uh, so uh, the fact that I am now building a new team, a larger team, is really going to help me for my research. Um, and I'm also uh, looking forward to, to help uh, women and people from the First Nation to maybe think about career in science and give them my uh, perspective on it and make it probably less hard on them. If they decided uh, to, to do so. So that's Wonderful. my plan. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, have you come across a guy called, he was, he was a guest here in episode 77, Matt Russo from the University oh. of Toronto. He's a professor for, uh, he's an astrophysicist. And at the same time, he is a sound wizard. He's, he sonifies um, space data. Oh, okay. Matt Russo. Uh, let me check because I it, it should have ring a bell with his last name being the same. So I just arrived. Russo, it's 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 R U S S O. Okay, okay, okay. He he does some he, he does some fascinating work um, sonifying space data as oh, a musician. Modern so, physics, yeah. So so yeah, he's not in the uh, the astronomy. He's in the physics department. Okay. Okay, so that's why I didn't meet him in the corridors. Okay, I see you that. should you should have uh, a coffee with him. Yeah, you know it's kind of funny. I like you know how the universe connects things. <laughs> so so yeah. I'm looking at his profile, and one of the beauty of the instruments that I am building they are called Fourier transfer spectrograph, but it's probably not relevant. The name. The beauty of those instruments is that they um, they make the light interfere. Mm -hmm. with itself uh, in order to gather information about it. And since I do that with the instruments, um, I build what we call those like interference patterns um, that are extremely similar to wave sound waves. Mm -hmm. um, and so my data can be also something you listen to. Wow. That makes sense. Wow. So maybe uh, we would have a good collaboration there. I'll you should, you to should totally around. meet. Yes. <laughs> and make sure you say hi from me. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> I was going to was going to talk a little more about your work as a scientist, but one last question regarding um your traditional roots um because now you mentioned that you have a young daughter. Um how does that oral tradition and that knowledge transfer from generation to generation work? Yeah. So what kind of stories are you passing on to next generations? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Because per se, you know, when I was young, uh, I was not necessarily told ancestral stories. Mm -hmm. um, this work of like gathering the oral tradition, I started a little bit more lately. But what really connected me with the culture was the, the practice of hunting. Because in my family, it, came, it comes from... Uh, the, my dad and my grandfather. And so it was the lin lineage of hunters. Mm -hmm. um, and on the mother's side, uh, they were from all over the place. And, and so therefore I, uh, I have not necessarily the, um, the cultural knowledge coming from the maternal side of my community. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've always felt like I was learning it from hearing, you know, mm -hmm. experience from other members of my community, but not necessarily, necessarily directly from my experience. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, as the mom, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm wondering how, how I'm going to transfer that into my 
my daughter. So for me, it is very important that she participate in the hunting. Um, I think that this distinct, this distinct, uh, you know, uh, difference in between what a, a, a hunter and a, and a mom would do and mm-hmm. the typical, you know, s- setting, uh, has changed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, so I will be able to do that with my daughter. Uh, and I want her also to, to kind of find what is our identity into that. And it's something that I've done myself, you know, finding what's your place, um, what's your identity, uh, knowing, you know, all of your, your ancestors and how you've been thought to be and to live. Um, it is, it is something that is also deeply personal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to be there for her. Mm-hmm. I want to provide her all of the information that I have. And I hope that she's going to explore it and, and live it, you mm-hmm. know, in the best way she can. Mm-hmm. Hunting has a bad reputation in the West. And so has meat eating at the moment. So uh, I'd be super curious to hear your take on this um, amongst First Nations. Um, is there something, are there practices like plant-based diets um, similar to veganism or vegetarianism? I'm not taking sides here, mm-hmm. of course. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a rare meat eater, uh, but just because I love vegetables. But but um, I, I'm not taking sides. I just want to like deeply understand yep. what's the right thing to do and how you feel about it because you're a hunter. Um, and you have, a, have made obviously a conscious decision to do so. So I'd be curious how you feel about it. Yeah. Oh, there's so many things I can say. First of all, like hunting is an experience. It's, it's something that is deeply difficult to do. Not everybody can hunt. Um, it's something deeply emotional as well. Um, I don't know of in my family any hunters that takes pleasure into taking the life of an animal. Every time you do it, it's for a purpose. And you have to kind of absorb the emotion that it triggers. Uh, and you have to respect the animal that gave us life for, for your family. And once you know everything that it takes, to get to the point where you have meat for the the family for the whole year, you know um, how much it's important not to uh, lose any of that meat and toss it away or uh, for any reason. And so you're extremely careful with it. Uh, And so when I see the world today, you know, if you go to the grocery store, you buy whatever piece of meat you want, you have all of the choices also which is something you normally don't have. <laughs> you, can't, you can't have so many filet mignon mm-hmm. on, the, on an animal, but some people only eat that. Uh, it puts things into perspective. And uh, I kind of want to say I don't eat meat that often either, mm-hmm. but when I do, I do respect it. Mm-hmm. And I definitely uh, am never going to um, yeah, make anything that is not respectful to mm-hmm. all of the process that it takes to go there. And mm-hmm. also the, what it took from me to get it, mm-hmm. uh, emotionally. And, um, mm-hmm. I think people, when they think about a hunter, they have this kind of picture of an old guy drinking beer and being drunk in the wood and probably like leaving garbages there and, and then killing an animal, lefting half of it there and probably spoiling most of it. That's what people think about, right? They have like this kind of very, mm-hmm. very negative image. And mm-hmm. then they probably put the antler on their, their pickup truck on the front mm-hmm. so that everybody mm-hmm. can see it. This is not how we do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is not how it happens. And uh, we are really um, mindful of the traces that we leave behind in the wood to to be almost invisible. And also... Um, to not lose anything and what we can use, we, we use. And, uh, and then the leftovers are, uh, what is really like impossible to use are going to be ate by wolves and 
<laughs> we usually come back a couple of days later to see how how it mm. went. Mm. Um, and so it's part of a of a cycle, you know. When you have Frederica and the wood, that's what would happen. You have like this kind of little ecosystem that happens mm. behind it. Um, and that's how, how I wish people would see it. Um, and I do think that if there were more people hunting, we would have people less people eating meat, hmm. and at least in less amount. Uh, and also they would be more careful about the quality of the what they eat. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's how I see it. Hmm. Uh, I don't I don't see my life hmm. without it. Hmm. Definitely. No, if I understand you correct, hunting is is not only a means to an end when it comes to feeding oneself and and a family. It's also it's also a means to connecting with nature and yeah. understanding nature. Because here, as you just said, it's a very difficult thing to do. You need to understand and listen to nature. Uh, try to pick up the language of nature. And I think a person ignorant of nature the 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 person not knowing the name of a tree will never be able to hunt a deer or a moose or whatever because yeah. they'll never encounter it in their ignorance yeah. and i have to say you know for someone who has never hunt i'm i'm just going to tell those people you know it is such a special moment when you actually have a conversation with an animal when you are able to hear them talking for so long that you can actually converse with them and they answer back when mm. they when you call them. And when you get to that point and you can hear them and they know you're there and you know they're there and you actually have this interaction. It doesn't happen often, but it is so special. And at that moment when you do it, you're like on in, on your instinct. It's mm. like you know exactly what to do. Hmm. And it's written in your DNA. That's how I can explain it. Hmm. Uh, and sometimes um, they are really quiet, but you can smell them. You can see their tracks. You can see what they've done. And it just feels like you belong there. Hmm. And uh, we're, we're, we're made to do that. That's, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Hmm. Laurie, let's move back to to a very mundane world of being a scientist. Um, we're experiencing, at least as I observe it, um, a pivotal moment in in human history where so many things seem to be changing, so many things seem to be on the brink, but so many things seem to be opening up also as opportunities. Um, especially also in the space industry. So there's a lot happening right now at a pace that is almost ungraspable, especially now with Starship almost ready to launch on a, on a regular basis. And once Starship is, is happening, I think the floodgates of colonization of orbit, uh, the Earth's orbit, if we want to talk about colonization, because this this is where we, where we're headed as humans still, unfortunately, the floodgates are opening because we're ready to bring massive amounts of cargo off Earth. <laughs> so, what do you think? Where is humanity at at this moment? Is this the moment that we're sort of starting to leave Earth, becoming interplanetary? No, I don't think so. <laughs> It's too early people, still. Uh, yeah. People got, that are going to do it are going to find out very quickly that it is hard. <laughs> <laughs> space is hard. <laughs> space. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, you know, some people are doing uh, high altitude climbing of mountains. Mm. They have to prepare months and then they do it. Um, and it's hard on their body, you know. Can you multiply that by 10 and, mm. and uh, ask? people without training to do it. Hmm. I don't think, um, I don't think people are gonna, uh, very quickly spend long periods of time hmm. away from, from the earth's gravity, um, and atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's my opinion. And also, you know, um, 
uh, space is uh, is harsh. Other planets, Mars, you know, it's also an environment that is extremely harsh. Um, you can do it for the sake of science to to test different things, maybe to to discover uh, new things, but ultimately for for a life to be comfortable and to actually have a family and everything mm-hmm. and no we're not there yet that's my mm-hmm. opinion we're too comfortable here and this planet Good. is too beautiful <laughs> <laughs> yeah who would want to live in a trailer for the rest of his life um on, yeah. on mars i mean like this is a a romantic idea but after three weeks i think you're through with it yeah yeah <laughs> and there's no return ticket exactly um, <laughs> Laurie, you're a um you research um the creation formation of stars out of curiosity what is the largest and what is the smallest star that um has been observed so far okay because i'm really wondering so, how small can it get yeah so as uh, like it's kind of limited by nuclear fusion so as there's a like a very specific limit <laughs> Uh, so it has about to, to be about 10 times the mass of Jupiter or a little bit above that mm-hmm. to be a star, uh, okay. per se. So once it reached this critical mass, the gravity of the star is, of the object is enough to compress its heart mm-hmm. and get the atoms uh, inside close enough together so that there's a magical reaction that happens to nuclear fusion and then boom, creates mm-hmm. energy, stars start to shine. Uh, on the heavier side, that's what is interesting because um, we don't know what is the actual limit. And also, uh, we think that the stars at the beginning of the universe were, were bigger because mm-hmm. the universe had less metals and it had less mm-hmm. chemical uh, uh, enrichment from the stars. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, right now, I can say that we have uh, very massive stars and um uh, in the Magellanic cloud that is called the in an area called the Tarantula nebula mm-hmm. um and uh, it's a couple of stars actually orbiting each other a binary and they are about 150 times the mass of the sun if not more uh and they are extremely a powerful system that emit, emit, emits a lot of x-rays and mm-hmm. yeah uh, you don't want to be around that but um in the early universe, they could have been a thousand times the mass of the sun, according to theory. So we're looking to, to see if maybe James Webb can catch some of those. Wonderful. It's very exciting. Yeah. Um, Laurie, I have two, uh, two questions um, that I'm asking each of my uh, esteemed guests at the, at the end of the show. Uh, question number one, um, provided you're going for a weekend visit to the moon or or mars or venus or wherever um it will be an exciting but super boring ride so what kind of music would you want to bring to that journey because we have a spotify playlist for the aspiring space traveler um you can look it up by the way and so i would like to um introduce your contribution to that playlist so you can pick whatever kind of Tune you want oh. to pick, provided it hasn't been picked so far. Okay. One song or just a band or like... One song. One song. Oh, I don't have the time to think about it. Oh, it's stressful. Um, there's one song that I, I wish I remembered the title. It's from Mars Volta, uh, but I don't remember the title. So I, uh, I'm not going to pick can that look one. It up. I can look it up. Okay. <laughs> Let me check. It's on my phone. Sure. <laughs> and you can't go wrong with your selection because we have a, a great variety of, of contributions so far. Yeah. Okay. Classical music, um, it's up to Black Sabbath and and progressive rock and even, um, what was it? Justin Bieber. So we have everything. You have that feeling just the beaver is there? Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I will say televators from Mars Mars Volta. Good. So be it. And last question. Um you've been ins- very inspiring so far on that show. So maybe one more piece of inspiration if 
if I may ask you, um, this is this um, podcast is called the Space Cafe Podcast, a coffee place. And in coffee places, you now and then have an espresso to energize yourself. Now, why don't you share an espresso for the mind with me, with the audience? Why don't you share something you think that could be a boost of energy to whoever listens to this? You can um, pick whatever kind of topic you want to pick. Okay, a boost of energy. Huh. An inspiration. Um, yeah, an inspiration. Oh, well, one good boost of energy I like to think of is you know, one of my friends was telling me how to, you know, work more efficiently. And apparently it has been proven scientifically that shorter days of work are uh, more efficient. And uh, more specifically, if you're doing a very long task that is super boring and you're like, Ah, I'm done with this, but I want to finish it. And you try to extend your day all the way up that you're finished with that morning task. Well, it actually is not the most efficient way to do it. You should stop in the middle of the mist and continue the next day to be more efficient because then your brain is going to do its magic and figure out a faster way to do it the next day. So it's not something we into, uh, you know, uh, that we do intuitively, uh, stopping when we're in the middle of something, but apparently we are. Uh, made to do that and uh, made to think about it subconsciously. <laughs> Wonderful. Laurie Rousseau Napton, thank you so much for taking the time. That was very inspiring. It was a pleasure. Yes. All right, folks, that's a wrap for today. A big shout out to, first of all, Laurie, of course. Thanks for taking the time and sharing your incredible journey. And a big shout out, of course, to all of you amazing listeners tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and rate the show. It'll help more space enthusiasts like you find us. If your curiosity for the cosmos is still tingling, why don't you hop over to Space Watch Global for an even deeper dive into all things space. And for those quick sips of space industry news, be sure to check out our Space Cafe radios. Until next time, keep looking up and stay curious, my friends. Bye-bye.